Just let us know. We'll, we'll kind of go like this. We'll give us I, yeah. I've often said in our family, the gift of ad lib is truly a gift. <laughs> so, well, while everybody's coming in, um, we wanted to just welcome you to our last class. And um, we were, we, I so enjoyed this. Our whole family's enjoyed it. Um, it's been uh, a long time in coming, and I've been praying about when I should do this, and the Lord finally opened the opportunity. It's been just a fun, uh, oh, it's been, I guess this is our ninth week now, mm -hmm. our eighth class, but ninth week. And uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, so this is our last class, but uh, we, are, we have two field trips. And uh, we hope that if you can, uh, join us for those. Now we've changed them a little bit. We just didn't get enough um, early interest to do Yosemite by charter bus. Um, because it was kind of expensive to rent the charter bus, so we needed at least 30 or 40 people to go. But we're still going. We're just going to carpool it, so it's plan B. And um, so uh, come on in. You're fine. And uh, so what we're going to do is meet at the church at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, that's early on a Saturday, but uh, it'll be worth it. It's about a three-hour drive there, so we should get there by 9.30, 10 o'clock by the time we get checked in the gate and all that and if you're um, if you have a pass you can use that since you're driving your own car and you can put as many people in your car as you want under that pass another reason to carpool uh, if you don't have a pass and you're senior this is a great time as my email said to get your pass because it's only ten dollars plus a ten dollar fee why they don't just say twenty dollars I don't know uh, but it's effectively twenty dollars for a lifetime membership if you're a senior to not just Yosemite, but all national parks. So it's a great deal. You, you definitely would want to do that. So that might be worth just going on a trip to get that pass. Uh, in fact, it's going to go up next year, so do it sometime in 2017. Um, then what we're going to do is spend the day there, have probably a, a brief devotional, uh, maybe before we leave, um, and then have a geology talk, and then we're going to be doing some very simple hiking. Don't worry, we're not doing half dome. Nothing too strenuous. Uh, it'll be mostly on paved walkways, and it'll be what you want it to be. So if you don't feel like taking that hike, that's okay. Bring a chair. Enjoy the beautiful scenery. Hopefully the weather's good. Um, it seems like we're getting a little bit out of the rainy pattern. So that's Yosemite. We'll be back by 630. The other trip is March 18th. It's before that. It's a Saturday. We're going to Shell Ridge in Walnut Creek. Once again, we're going to meet at the church in Carpool. Uh, we'll meet, I think... I think the flyer said 8 30. Uh, I think it was 8 30 that we're meeting. Um, we'll have a devotional. We'll go. We'll spend about an hour, hour and a half at Shell Ridge. That's about all you need. And then we're going to go from there to the top of Mount Diablo, which is a short drive away. Um, actually, in distance, it's pretty short. It takes about a half hour to 40 minutes to go up the windy uh, state park uh, road to get to the top. So you don't have to, again, walk. We're going to drive. And we'll have lunch up at the top. We'll have another short geology talk um, while we're looking at the view. Hopefully it's a nice day. And um, there's a museum up there um, and a picnic ground. So bring your own picnic lunch. And we'll have a picnic lunch up there. And after we're done there, then you can either stick around and enjoy the park, enjoy that, or you can head on home or go into Walnut Creek for a nice uh, early dinner or something. So uh, that's the plan. All right, with that, why don't we jump into session eight, Abby? So this is my daughter, Abby Taraskas, my youngest daughter. Hi, Abby. Hi. Hello. So Hi. she's going to be sharing the, the talk with us. And this is something we did for homeschooling, right? Mm -hmm. So what was it? Um, it was a study on the um, U.S. West Coast geology, so everything that relates to us, basically, in California and the surrounding states. And it was really fascinating. I think it was my favorite talk that um, my dad did with me, and um, I loved it. And we're yeah. just glad to share it with you guys. So, so as I you know, we homeschool. Yes, Joanne? Did you walk in some of these places? I, I did we walk? Did we walk? Um, did we walk? Well, we didn't walk the whole coast, no. no, but we did walk in some of these places. In fact, you're going to see pictures that mm -hmm. we took. So uh, we had some field trips, mm -hmm. didn't we? 
Um, so as some of you probably know, or most of you know, that we homeschool, um, have homeschooled all the way, and this is our last year. Abby's a senior. So uh, that it's really going to be Carrie's celebration, 20 years of homeschooling, and uh, all three of them all the way. So that's a big accomplishment. And I teach on Fridays, and so I, I work my schedule out so I can teach Friday mornings and work Friday afternoons. Mm -hmm. And so I generally will teach the sciences. And so this one was a year study of geology that culminated with this project. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of fun learning about rocks. Um, so. What we want to do is talk about it from a biblical worldview. And in order to do that, there's some foundations, some principles. We've been talking about this, haven't mm -hmm. we? So what's the first one, Abby? So um, what we've been trying to share and what we need to take as true is that God is true and what he said is true and there is no falsehood in him. And that's really foundational for studying the Bible. And it even says in John 17, 17, where um, sanctify them by the truth, your word is true, and this is um, the author speaking to God. So um, we need to have God sanctify us by his truth. And that's the first foundation, isn't it? Because if mm -hmm. we're going to understand geology from a biblical perspective, we got to understand that the Bible is true. And, and so that is absolutely foundational. And that it can also be relied upon for mm -hmm. um, historical references and scientific references to, to a certain extent. So. So the second foundation is what we've been covering in this class. Not only do we believe God's word is true, but we believe that the first verse of God's word is true, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so in order to understand geology from a biblical perspective, it seems obvious, but you have to firmly believe that, that God did create the heavens and the earth, that they didn't happen through... Uh, some evolutionary process or even through theistic evolution that it was six literal days as scripture says and we've done pretty much a good job of covering that over the last nine weeks. So what's the third principle? Um, that we have to take as true that there was a global flood and um, as we saw before there couldn't have been an ark and there, um, without having a global flood because what's the reason for building an ark? Because you could just easily walk to safety, but um, there was a global flood, and as it says um, in Genesis six through eight, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. That's um, seven eleven, and then the windows of heaven were opened. Um, again, speaking of a global flood, and the waters prevailed upon the whole earth, not just in one spot. So um, that's a foundational truth, and it wouldn't make sense if there wasn't a global flood. And so by going back to foundation number one, we take these references out of Genesis that they're not just poetic language, but that they're, they're speaking of something that actually happened. And in order to understand geology and what we see around California, Nevada, Arizona, we, we interpret it in the light of these, these statements. Mm -hmm. Okay, so biblical versus secular. What we were really surprised at in our study of, of geology was how much we came to rely on sec secular sources. That we were, I was astonished especially that the secular geologists, those, and by that I mean those who do not prescribe to a biblical perspective, many of the things that they were saying we were in agreement with. In fact, when it came down to it, the main distinction really boiled down to time, uh, in particular duration and frequency. But the, the techniques, the methods of what was happening, much of what we're going to present to you today, actually a lot of the videos and clips are from secular scientists, are, are not from Christian scientists. And so really, the, the, how it happened, we all, we're somewhat in agreement. Mm -hmm. But when it happened, how long it took, that we're in a lot of disagreement. And we look to the Bible once again to set those time periods as a reliable source for those time periods. Um, so um, the age determination, we'll, we'll speak a little bit that, to that tonight, but certainly we could probably fill, oh, probably two of these workshops, two hour workshops, just talking about dating rocks. Um, and uh, that is, um, as you'll see, questionable at best. There's really some good research being put out by creationists 
to show that the rocks, the rock dating methods are just not reliable. Um, but that's not the purpose of tonight's talk. We'll touch on it, but if that interests you, you there's a lot of resources that you should uh, look up and, and do some of your own study on. And, and Answers in Genesis and Institute of Creation Research are all excellent organizations to get that. And so this presentation will be based on those three previously stated foundations. All right, Abby, so what are we looking at here? So right here, um, as my dad pointed out last week, when the flood came upon the earth, the foundations of the deep were broken up and the um, tectonic plates um, slid upon molten lava. And so what we're seeing right here, there used to be one um, piece of land in the whole world and it was called Pangaea. And so when the flood broke up, it split apart and this is where we get the continents today. And you can even see how they kind of fit together. And um, it was pr pretty fascinating just looking at it. Mm -hmm. And I was just reminded, we forgot to pray. So uh -huh. why don't we uh, commit this to the Lord? This, And Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, this opportunity to again come and talk about your world and your creation and, and your word even in light of what we see even in the rocks. And so I pray that you would guide our conversation, help Abby and I just to um, be uh, calm and to be able to communicate effectively in your name, amen. Okay, so so yes, this uh, Pangea, in fact, let me play this again. Um, these graphics that you're seeing come from secular geology um, sources. And we agree with that. We agree from a biblical worldview that there was a supercontinent, maybe called Pangaea, maybe in some other form. It really doesn't matter what form it had. But that um, when the Bible talks about the, 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 the deep being broken up, I believe it was talking about um, the, the, what we call today uh, plate tectonics. Uh, when you study earthquakes, they talk about the, the, the tectonic plates that, uh, that continents sit on, that the oceans sit on. Basically, you could picture the world as uh, puzzle pieces. Again, I'll play this graphic again uh, so you can see it. Now, what is interesting is when they study this, you'll notice right here um, that South America and Africa, doesn't it look like they just even fit together? Uh, and, and you see that all throughout. Um, in fact, let me just play it again so you can see it uh, come together again. Uh, not only does it look like they fit together, but when they geologists go on on one side of the Atlantic on South America and look at the geology there, and then they go to the other side of the Atlantic and look at the geology in Africa, it's very, very similar, if not identical in places. And so it was definitely pulled apart. Secular geologists believe that. Christian geologists believe that. The question is, how long did it take? Now, continents are still moving apart today. Mm -hmm. The plates are still moving by centimeters, millimeters per year. And so those who hold to a uniform, uniformitarian view believe that it was always that way. And therefore, that's where they get the millions of years. But in Scripture, we see what, Abby? That it was a global flood. It only took one year mm -hmm. at the most to um, split apart the continents and the um, the weather and things were very drastic and so it's not like you can't judge today from just this is the way it's always been. No, it hasn't always been this way. We don't know. We weren't back there in the time that this took happen. Um, this happened so we can't judge from today's circumstances. But Yeah, yeah. So when we got this rapid plate tectonic movement, what you had was you had these huge land masses crashing into one another. Um, and when vehicles collide, what happens when two vehicles come together? What happens to their hoods if it's a head-on? They crumple up, right? And some of those hood, some of the parts of their hood will go up in elevation, won't it? Well, the same thing happens when continents collide. You have crumple zones. And tonight, we're going to look at crumple zones. We know them as the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades. Those are the crumple zones. And in fact, you even get the low spots. And we'll talk about Nevada and the salt, the Great Salt Sea, mm -hmm. uh, Great Salt Lake. Um, and uh, 
secular geologists say, yeah, that happened, but it's been happening at a very slow pace. We as believers in the Bible, we go, well, we have a cause here. We see it, Genesis 6 through 8. There's a cause. And we believe it was happening very fast. So when you have an accident between two cars, a head-on, one's going, one pair is going 75 miles an hour, the other pair is going five miles per hour, which one's going to have a bigger crumple zone? Well, the 75 miles per hour, right? Huge crumple zone. Five miles per hour, slow. You might have a lot of momentum, but I still don't think you're going to see a crumple zone like the Himalayas with Mount Everest having marine fossils at the top of it over 20,000 feet high. Um, in fact, uh, watching this graphic one more time, watch India. India slammed into Asia, see it? And came from quite a distance. Its momentum must have been booking. And I when it, say it, but where, which one is India? Right here. Keep your eye on this one, right here. Right. I'll play it again. The Himalayas are the biggest mountains in the world. And remember, this graphic didn't come from a Christian geologist. Mm -hmm. This came from secular geologists. All right, so with that introduction, we're going to move into U.S. West Coast geology from a biblical worldview. And we're going to do it region by region. So first we have a timeline. Mm -hmm. So, Abby, um, there are three um, basic periods right here. What are those periods? Can you tell us a little bit about them? So the first one is the antediluvium, right, period. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, before the flood where it was calm, uh, people were building, there was no really any weather problems, there was no rain, they mm -hmm. hadn't experienced that yet. And then... Um, antediluvium, that's kind of a so big it's word. So before... Um, deluge, right? Deluge, basically. <laughs> You've yeah. probably heard of antebellum, right? The antebellum period before Civil War. Same thing, antediluvium, before the flood. And the third one? So um, the, it's called the Ice Age or period, one, or sorry. the second one. And that's after the flood, right after where um, there was major, just the flood caused so um, much, um, like, sorry. I'm just pointing it okay. out right there. So much problems with the earth. The earth was just trying to calm and it couldn't. And there was um, lots of um, ice that came upon the earth. And mm -hmm. in the last age? The last age is called the equilibrium age. And that's basically the earth coming to a standstill where we see it today, where there's still ice caps, but they're basically melting from the flood. And what, I mean, from the ice age and it's coming back to a standstill mm -hmm. and where it was before the flood came upon the earth. And actually, Abby and I coined that last term. We had heard you read in the research about the antediluvium. A lot of those books talk about antediluvium, and then they talk about the Ice Age. But what I really believe is happening, and, and this is why we coined it, is the equilibrium age. Um, when you have a catastrophe the size of the flood, it takes a while for things to come back into equilibrium. And much of what we're seeing today, I believe, is still it coming into equilibrium. For example, the polar caps, the ice caps, have been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And I think they will continue to shrink because I don't believe the Earth is in complete equilibrium yet. I think we're approaching that. For those of you who know graphing, we're getting down to the asymptotic levels, you know, where it's approaching equilibrium, but um, we're, it will continue to get to that level. So um, Abby, Abby did a good job of describing those. That antediluvian period up to the flood was about 1,500 years. A lot of people don't realize that, that there was 1,500 years of history up to the time of Noah. And uh, the big geological uh, things that happened, and Abby and I actually created this graphic. We did not borrow this from anybody. So creation, Pangaea, there were very few fossils during that time period. Uh, we see only minor um, erosion. erosion and sedimentation, very minor, mostly related to like beaches or something way down deep uh, below uh, where we would call pre-flood um, uh, deposits. Um, but then the flood happened and that set everything loose. Continents were moving all over the world. Uh, tsunamis, as we talked about last week, 
huge amounts of sedimentation, which we see evidence in the Grand Canyon. Uh, rapid tectonic plate uh, movement, and when those plates crashed, that's what we call uplift, is those crumple zones. The technical term uh, is uplift, where, where mountains come up. And then we had water being trapped, because as they crashed, water, inland water, was being trapped in between those crumple zones. Um, and then uh, during the Ice Age, um, we have a lot of volcanic activity mm -hmm. still occurring. Uh, in fact, I believe that's when Yellowstone was happening, was during the Ice Age. Um, glaci glaciation, just another, a fancy term for glaciers, uh, glacier lakes, which we'll talk about tonight. Uh, but what's fascinating to me is the equilibrium age, and that's where things are slowing down. Again, we find few fossils. Only the fossils really occurred during the, the flood, before and after, really nothing. Glaciers are becoming less and less. Volcanic activity is becoming less and less, and we'll explain why. Uh, lakes are drying up, and we'll explain why. Um, and then we, we relate some things that you might uh, know here. Um, the, when, when things happen, like uh, right after the flood, Bryce and Zion and the Rockies, Sierras and Yellowstone formed. Mount Shasta, it, according to secular geologists, when Mount Shasta formed, was right here, and then the Grand Canyon, Snake River Gorge, Scablands, and Sonora Desert uh, shortly after or towards the end of the Ice Age, and then Mount Rainier right here. Abby, why don't you um, hit the button and talk about some famous people. So, um, when my dad and I were making this, um, what I found was really fascinating is connecting the people in the Bible to what's occurring around the world and um, what's taking place. And so Adam obviously was during creation week and um, Noah was during the flood. Um, Abraham would be basically around the time Mount Shasta formed and the Ice Age, and the ice age took place. Um, Job great. was a little bit after Abraham, so um, about still the same the time, still in the Ice Age. Um, Moses a little bit after the Ice Age coming into the um, is that an equilibrium, equilibrium age. Um, David around the time Mount Rainier formed, um, and then Jesus right after Mount Rainier and um, still in the equilibrium age. So. And by equilibrium, what we mean we have a little demonstration here, Newton's cradle, and you probably play with this. I like to play with it in my office when I don't want to do work. Oops, yeah. right, I believe that. Let's try this. So, um, what, no surprise, what will happen is this will get slower and slower and slower. But that first swing is that first catastrophic impact. It would have been the flood. Mm -hmm. But what the Earth is doing is basically coming back into equilibrium, just as this pendulum is coming back into equilibrium. And so what that looks like is temperatures are moderating. Ice is going away. Before the flood, uh, creation geologists and meteorologists really believed there was no polar cap. There was no ice uh, there. Uh, it's amazing, as you'll see to the, tonight, that the Ice Age was actually used by God to get the animals back around the world. And it created land bridges. So let's move on. We got lots to cover. Um, so wait a minute. I thought scientists have proved the age of rocks. Let's show show just a brief video on on that. Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now, this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay. So if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? That seems like a lot. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. 
The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is, the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. All right, so that's just, uh, uh to get you started, uh, I would really recommend um, looking at that a little deeper. And carbon-14 dating has actually been in the news this week, um, and it's interesting as well. All right, so we're going to start with the Pacific Northwest. And we got some people that originate. Who originates from Pacific Northwest in this room? A few? All right, good, good. So we're going to look at that area. Um, I, I know the Witties didn't originate there, but they spent some time there. And so, what states are we looking at in particular, Abby? Um, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Idaho. And so, we put together this graphic just mm -hmm. to represent a few things that were happening. So, the first thing is what? The floodwaters, flood right? Mm -hmm. And so, we do that to represent that it was all covered. Again, it was probably more like what you saw in Pangaea, continents moving rapidly. But after the flood, what happened is we still, or towards the end of the flood, we had these plates moving. In this case, we had the Juan de Fuca, Juan de Fuca plate crashing into what? The North American plate. North American plate. And what type of, um, of uh, action has, is that called? It's called um, subduction. Subduction. Subduction, and it's when the Juan de Fuca plate is going under the North American plate, and so it basically pushes up our plate. That's where we get all the um, high mountains, the Rocky Mountain Range, and the Cascade Range. Yeah. Again, it was we believe it was rapid, not gradual. That it was rapid, and so you see your crumple zones. You have the Rocky Mountains, the Cascades, and along with that, because of subduction, because you basically have a plate going underneath it, you get, and we'll show you some graphics later, that type of uh, seismic activity creates a lot of volcanic activity. And if you know the Northwest, you know there's still active volcanoes in that area. But if you also know the Northwest, you know that not too in the distant past, there was a lot of volcanoes uh, more than what's active today. We see evidences of more volcanoes. Um, name a few for me. You probably know some of them. Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, I heard. Mount Lassen. There's a few more famous ones. Hood, Shasta. Very good. You got, got quite a few of them. Uh, Crater Lake. Crater Lake. There's a lot of famous ones there. Um, 
And then uh, comes the Ice Age, shortly after the flood, after those tectonic plates came together. And what you see on the screen is about the extent of, of the ice slopes. We'll look more at this in some of the other slides we have. But after that, Abby, what happens? So um, from the rain that was basically pooled when the continent smashed, there was um, formed glacial lakes. And one of them was Lake Missoula, which covered Missoula as we know it today. And um, it was massive, really. And then um, Glacial Lake Columbia, which was in Washington. Mm -hmm. And um, are you going to talk about what happened? Or? Yeah. Okay. And they basically drained. As mm -hmm. We're going we're to actually watch a video on this, but they drained and formed some very uh, unique landforms. In fact, uh, Randall was telling me about he liked to fish in the potholes. Potholes are remnants of, of the uh, flood from uh, Glacial Lake Missoula uh, and, and that area of eastern Washington called the Scablands. Uh, you'll see some pictures here in a moment, basically the draining of those lakes. So is this Noah's flood? What do you guys think? No, isn't it? No. Nope. It's actually an artist's red rendition of the Missoula Lake flood. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, let's, and it was massive. <laughs> let's watch this video. There are especially two aspects of the Lake Missoula flood that impinge upon biblical earth history. First of all, how many floods were there? The secular scientists First of all, said there was one, J. Harlan Bretz, when he first studied this area starting in 1923, believed in one flood. But then, because of a peculiar ash layer in some rhythmites in eastern Washington, they decided that, well, there was probably 40 floods. Then, in northern Washington, in the Sandpoil Valley, they saw what they say almost 100 of these rhythmites. And therefore, they said there was about 100 Lake Missoula floods. So that means Lake Missoula has to fill up about 100 times and then break. If it takes 50 years to fill up on the average glacial Lake Missoula, which is an underestimate, that's uh, about 5,000 years of time at just the peak of the Ice Age. And yet they say there's 50 Ice Ages in regular succession now based on deep sea cores. So that's a lot of Lake Missoula floods and lots of time. So this is a challenge to biblical earth history, which teaches a, a young earth. So we will be examining how many floods there were. A second aspect is that if there was a glacial Lake Missoula, that means there was an ice age because a lobe of the Cordillan ice sheet from British Columbia came down through Northern Idaho and blocked the Clark Fork River and created an ice dam and backed up the lake here. So that means there was an ice age uh, after the flood. Well, here we see in the background horizontal lines that are very even. These are shorelines from Glacial Lake Missoula on the northern slopes of the National Bison Range. These shorelines are uh, all over where Glacial Lake Missoula was. They are down the Bitterroot Valley and they're up in this area just uh, southwest of Flathead Lake. The most famous ones are around the city of Missoula. They're very even, and they're approximately 35 feet on the average. Well, if there's any icon that represents the Glacial Lake Missoula flood, it is these shorelines. Because they're all over, you have to have a lake for a flood, and so it, it gives you the dimensions of the lake. Also, in some aspects uh, where the lake occurred, there's raised deltas where a stream came into the lake, and it formed a delta and then when Glacial Lake Missoula broke, that delta is left hanging. So these are evidence that the lake uh, existed at one time. Well, we're about 2,500 feet above sea level here. And based on the highest shorelines, the lake was about 4,000, 4,200 feet. So that means that the lake was about 1,500 to 1,700 feet above me here. From the highest shorelines, we can determine the volume of the lake. The volume of the lake turns out to be 540 cubic miles, twice the volume of Lake Erie. It was 1,000 feet deep over the city of Missoula and 2,000 feet deep where the ice dam was in northern Idaho to the west. Glacial Lake Missoula was blocked by a finger of the Cordillan ice sheet that covered British Columbia 
and four lobes came down into the northern United States, the Puget Sound lobe, the Okanagan lobe, and the Purcell Trench lobe in northern Idaho, and the Flathead lobe, which just ended just north of us. The, the lobe in northern Idaho was the one that blocked the Clark Fork River, and so as ice was melting at the peak of the ice age, it was, it was filling up. And we can estimate how deep the ice was that blocked it. It was approximately 2,500 feet thick. The lake was 2,000 feet deep uh, along the Montana-Idaho border. We can tell by the surrounding north-south mountains that were not glaciated about how deep it was, so it was about 2,500 feet. Ice isn't going to hold a, a lake that's increasing in volume year by year for very long. So one day, it just uh, probably lifted the ice or, or, or tunneled through the ice. And within a matter of hours, it just broke through and emptied out in two days. On this field trip, I'm gonna show evidence that there was only one large Lake Missoula flood. Now, there might've been a few smaller ones afterwards that were insignificant. So the question is, what's the explanation of those shorelines up there? Well, because I actually walked up them and, and gave an estimate of the vertical distance about 35 feet, that they're very regular. I believe that each shoreline is probably one year of filling of the lake. In one year, it raises 35 feet on the average and protects the shorelines below it, and it continues to do that, and that's why it was protected. Otherwise, if each shoreline represents one flood, like the secular scientists believe, you'd have a chaos of shorelines where each lake would come up and it would uh, destroy parts of the other shorelines that were made from previous lakes. It would just be a mess. But these are so even over this area that I believe it was just one filling uh, in approximately 80 years at the peak of the ice age. Now these shorelines are just as distinctive on hard rocks as they are on soft rocks. They haven't been eroded. This tells me that Glacial Lake Missoula and the Glacial Lake Missoula flood was recent. Here we are uh, about five miles north of St. Ignatius in northwest Montana in a valley that was covered with about uh, 1,500 feet of the waters of Glacial Lake Missoula. Behind me, you see a gentle rise. It's an east-west rise, about 100 feet. This was considered the Mission Moraine and was believed to be the furthest south extent of the flathead lobe of the Cordillan Ice Sheet that covered uh, British Columbia. And this was believed for 100 years <laughs> until a man decided to examine the, the sediments in that rise and other places and found out that it wasn't moraine material. In fact, he found out it was bottom, lake bottom uh, sediments of Glacial Lake Missoula. Furthermore, he examined these bottom sediments and found no channels. It was all just evenly bedded all the way down to bedrock. Well, there's channels on top of it. So to him, this was evidence of one large filling of Glacial Lake Missoula because if Glacial Lake Missoula filled and emptied, filled and emptied, these lake bottom sediments would be filled with channels and other evidence of erosion in the time it takes to fill the lake. And because there aren't any, this is pretty powerful evidence that there was only one glacial Lake Missoula flood. Well, it's interesting that there's lots of lake bottom sediments in this northern part of where glacial Lake Missoula used to be. Even though the ice dam broke, the water was rushing out at 80 miles an hour through Eddy's Narrows. Then the question is, why do we have this ridge back there? Well, here's what I think happened. To the south of us is the National Bison Range and a bunch of hills. And to the east of us is the High Mission Mountains. So as Glacial Lake Missoula was draining out that way, it was kind of converging in here and going around the Northern Bison Range out through the valley to the south and into the Flathead River. So I think this was a fast recurrence in here and eroded the lake bottom sediments in here. And that's why this, this ridge here is, uh, is east-west, is because it, it just was going out uh, mainly to the west and it just scoured near the mountains here.
We're on the Polson Moraine, just south of the city of, of Polson, overlooking Flathead Lake in the background. Now this is a real moraine. It's a, a ridge of gravel and sand where the glacier pushed it out and deposited along the edge. It's a terminal moraine of the Flathead Lobe, of the Cordillan Ice Sheet. The Cordillan Ice Sheet covered practically all British Columbia. East of the Rocky Mountains, we had the Laurentide Ice Sheet that covered central and eastern Canada and was also in the northern United States. This is the furthest extent of the, the ice sheet. So Glacier Lake Missoula was ponded right against this ice sheet and was approximately oh, 1,200 feet deep right here. And of course, the melting of, of the flathead lobe added to the water. As the glacier moved uh, south because of its surface slope towards the south, it probably scooped up a lot of debris from Flathead Lake and over deepened it. That's probably one reason why we have this moraine right here and Flathead Lake behind us. We are at Camas Prairie in Northwest Montana, one of the most famous localities associated with the Lake Missoula flood. As you see in the background here, you see some long rolling hills. Well, those are ripple marks caused by when the Lake Missoula flood was moving south out of the Little Bitterroot Valley that way, and it was moving over these ridges, and it formed these ripple marks about two miles wide, up to 30 feet high, going way down in this valley. There are gravel ripple marks. Now, the water was coming out of um, the Little Bitterroot Valley, which was banked against the flathead lobe of the Cordillan Ice Sheet. And the Little Bitterroot Valley is loaded with lake bottom sediments, which have been uh, partly eroded, especially in the north. But they're very flat on, on the top. And along the edges, there's shorelines from the lake uh, all over the place. When the lake broke in, in northern Idaho, the water started rushing across this area because it was a thousand feet deep at this point. So as it's rushing out, it formed these ripple marks. It is interesting that uh, J. Harlan Bretz, who was the original discoverer of the Lake Missoula flood, he started publishing papers in the Journal of Geology and the Geological Society of America Bulletin starting in 1923. Bretz's work in eastern Washington was really a a great piece of geologically detective work. He started this by looking at geological maps just published from Eastern Washington. He didn't know where the water came from, yet he was able to deduce from the geology and the geomorphology, the shape of the surface there, that there was a massive flood. It was obvious. He was able to put this all together to, to come up with a monstrous flood, even though he never knew the sources. The data spoke for itself. And he ended about 1932 with a, a long monograph on Grand Coulee. And it's interesting, in that time, in 10 years, he never knew the source of the water. He kind of considered it came from the north, from the Okanagan lobe of the Cordillan Ice Sheet, ponded in there under the ice or something like that. Our lake banked up against the, the ice and then it broke. That was his original thought. So he really never knew the source of the water. He didn't know about Glacier Lake Missoula. But it's interesting, a man named Pardee, a geologist named Pardee, knew about it. And when Bretz was describing all the many hundreds of features as evidence of the Lake Missoula flood back at a meeting of the Geological Society of America, Pardee was there and he knew about Glacier Lake Missoula because he was the one who did the research in this area. He knew about the Camas Prairie and the evidence of it is for catastrophic flow of water uh, coming over this ridge and out this valley. He knew this, but he kept quiet about it because his supervisor, Richard Foster Flint, which was one of the most well-known quaternary geologists, or I say geologists in the world, was strongly against the Lake Missoula flood. Party kept quiet because the world view of geologists was not only naturalism, that nature is all there is, but a part of naturalism is that you only use present processes to explain all the past rocks. And that's called uniformitarianism. And that was the world view that was predominant at that time and still is at this time. This world view started during the, the Enlightenment, uh, the, called the Age of the Enlightenment, starting in the 1700s when scholarly people rebelled against the Bible and they were gonna, decided they were gonna figure out everything by pure reason. 
So they reasoned that, well, we have all these rocks uh, to explain and fossils to explain. So what principles do we have? Well, we can only use what we see going on today to explain all the past. So that assumption became dogma starting in the 1700s, even before the principle of uniformitarianism became uh, formulated by Hutton in 1795 and Lyell between 1830 and 1833 when he published his Principles of Geology. It was used 50 to 80 years before that. So at that time of the Lake Missoula flood controversy, but in the late and mid uh, 20s to the early 1930s, that was the principle they were looking at. And because of that principle, they said they don't believe in big floods. They don't even believe in too many small floods because you have to only use present processes, which are small little floods on rivers or flash floods to explain things, or a river delta to explain all these vast array of sedimentary rocks that sometimes go for hundreds, even thousands of miles. So they were stuck with that. And one geologist said that we can't accept the Lake Missoula flood because it's too biblical. By, by the way, Michael Ord, uh, we've introduced him in, in some of our past classes. He's a Christian meteorologist, retired from the National Weather Service. He's done a lot of research and he's the author of some of the books you've seen on the Ice Age. Um, very, very uh, godly and, and um, academic man. So you see some of here, the pictures of the scab lands and, and uh, here's some. Abby, why don't you talk about a little bit what so when right we took here, these? Um, we have some family who lives in Missoula and so we took a um, trip and visited them. And while we were there, it was on um, the 4th of July, so we clam climbed the hill right here. Middle button. Yeah. Middle button. So we we're sitting basically right here and we we're waiting for the fireworks to go off around here. And so it was really fun. We got to see some cool fireworks. This was about 10 30 at night. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's still up and playing. And it's really weird. <laughs> but um, it was really fun and we enjoyed it. Basically looking some out time. about the level of, light of the Missoula flood, mm -hmm. about 1,500 feet. Well, we're actually still underwater at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, here's, you saw the picture here, Missoula, mm -hmm. and I have lots of family there. Um, Scablands, uh, you can see, you don't need to be an expert in erosion to see this is erosion. Lots of water moving through here. And the uh, potholes, is this where you were fishing, Randall? Probably. Yeah. The potholes, Cooley, uh, Washington. I mean, you don't have to be a scientist to see that is a scar. That is a ero huge erosional scar. A lot of water did that. And so, again, just more pictures. Um, another interesting thing, and we'll point this out in a couple different ways, but I have noticed that when I go to national parks and I look at signs and look at some of their literature, you know, you see the millions and millions of years. But things that we can date, that we can see, and they can date somewhat accurately, um, they, for some reason, come up with 4,000 years a lot. The year, 4,000 years shows up a lot. Well, why is that relevant? Well, from a biblical perspective, that's when the flood happened, about 4,000 years ago, maybe 4,500, but around then. And so notice that this graphic, which we got, again, from a secular source, this is not a Christian source, but notice these volcanoes that you listed off and their eruptions. But where does the timeline start? 4,000 years ago. Hmm, interesting. Whose worldview does this fit? Hmm. And also this, this sign, Abby, this where sign, were we um, here? Do you remember? We were in Oregon, right? Or yes, what? near Sisters, Oregon, Oregon at the and, volcano park. Um, What's interesting, if you look right here, it says, you can probably not read it too well, it says less than 6,000 years ago. And so from a secular point of view, that's a pretty short amount of time. But for our point of view, that's right around the flood. And it's pretty fascinating. And this was a secular um, sign. And so it's yeah. interesting. So as we're looking at evidence, we're looking at the natural evidence, but then we look at signs and we're like, this 4,000, 6,000 years keeps popping up. Well, I think there is a reason for that, and it fits our worldview. Mount Shasta is another example, mm -hmm. and 
it should look a lot more snow covered than that. This was during the drought years. In fact, uh, that's, that's pretty scary uh, exposed. It, it doesn't usually get that exposed. All right, so that's the north, northwest. We're going to look at one more section before we take a break, and that is a little bit to the south of there. We're going to talk about Utah, Idaho, and Nevada. These are some of my favorite places to go um, for, for amazing geology. Um, and the most prominent thing there is the Snake River. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of stories to tell you about there and a sad one about my last truck. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> so, yeah, it's still there. We pushed it into the Snake River Gorge. <laughs> um, so, Abby, why don't you talk us through here? I'll push the buttons, but um, what, what, did, what started here? So, um, this is another glacial lake, or after the Ice Age, once again, while the, um, the tectonic plates smashed together, water was pulled, and, so, um, and also from the torrential rains during the Ice Age, um, this huge Bonville Lake formed, and um, as it dried up, it grew smaller, and... Well, it breached oh, first. It breached. Oops, sorry, I, I, I messed up your Oops. thing. Let's start it again. So um, it breached at Red Rock Pass. At Red Rock Pass, and it went through the Snake Gorge, cutting it out to where we see it today. So it's massive, this huge gorge, because of lots of water running through in a short amount of period of time. And um, and it basically dewatered. Dewatered. And once it got to to where it breached at Red mm -hmm. Rock Pass, it dropped in elevation. And at that time, it took on a different name called Provo Lake, a historic Provo Lake. You think of the town Provo, right? Lake, Lake Provo. And then, as time has progressed, because it has no outlet and because it really has no, no source, the, 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 the original sources were from a, from a very unique event, not, not from just normal rainfall, it has been drying up. And so it's what we call the Great Salt Lake. And it's salty because of the ocean water that was trapped there. And so as time passed and as it emptied, the salt just got even more condensed and even more saltier. So, and because it has no outlet, yeah. just like most lakes, like the Dead Sea in Israel, the Salton Sea, any lakes that do not have a natural outlet, uh, as the sun evaporates it, it tends to condense and get more and more salty over time. Um, but it is a, a great example of the flood, uh, the effects of the flood. And so, again, as Abby said, how that happened was the tectonic plates crashing into one another. When you get those crumple zones, you got water trapped. Now, true, a lot of water uh, fl flowed off of the continents. That was the purpose of the rapid tectonic plate movement, by God lifting up the mountains, getting the water to separate from the land. But much water did get trapped. And so we see evidences of this. In fact, this next uh, graphic here, uh, you can see uh, lots of historic, what they call ancient lakes or, or Ice Age lakes. You have the one we looked at, Bonville, uh, but Lake Lahatan. If you've ever driven um, Interstate 80 through Nevada, you'll notice huge salt deposits through these areas. In fact, it's fascinating to see the remnants of all these lakes and even Death Valley it was the same situation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but all of this water. Now, where did the water come from? Well, one, the flood, directly from the flood. It got trapped there. Second, from what caused the Ice Age? Um, the the um, super El Nino conditions, basically the, the warm, warm oceans, so averaging maybe 85 degrees worldwide creating enormous amounts of precipitation in colder areas falling as snow, but in non, not as cold areas falling as rain. But imagine 500 years of super El Nino type of conditions. That would put a lot of water out there. Just one year of a lot of rain this year put a lot of water out there. You could imagine hundreds of years of that would put a lot of water out there. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, is from the, the melting of the glaciers themselves, too, created a lot of water. So that's where all that water came from, very unique situations, which we will never see again. Um, why are the lakes 
drying up? Well, it's because of this. It is going into equilibrium. There was no source other than catastrophe for that water. And as we get further and further away from the catastrophe, we're getting into a more of a status quo, into an equilibrium state. Okay, so um, on our trip to visit our family in Missoula, we um, passed the Snake River Gorge, and it's really gorgeous. Um, we stayed a couple of days here, and um, this is a bridge. Not, not by Oops. choice. Huh? Yeah, and so we saw the sunset. Yeah, not by choice. <laughs> our truck died, and we had to buy a new truck here, which is, yeah. <laughs> and so we saw the sunset, and it was really pretty, and you could see the Snake River um, right here going through along and there's even like a golf place right here and I never thought it was this wide and so it was really fascinating to see it. What other famous non-geological thing happened right <laughs> at this point? Um, what was his name again? I always forget. Evil Knievel. Yeah, Evil Knievel. He tried to jump it and as right you here. can see that wasn't very bright because it is massive and so <laughs> I don't know how he was trying to cross that. Somebody yeah. way before Abby's time. <laughs> All right, so I think we're going to take a break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about the Southwest and California. So enjoy your break. So good job, good job. Did you bring them in here? All right, good, good. All right, well, we are back. Come on in, Jerry. Your wife just won the bean plant contest. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to continue. We're going to move southward now. Um, and uh, this is where we spent a lot of time mm -hmm. at the Grand Canyon and uh, Bryce mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, Zion. And so we got to see a lot of that. So why don't we talk through, Abby? Um, so what happened here so i'm going to press the button here so prior to tectonic plate movement then what happened so um during the ice age once again as the waters because this is lower so there was lots of torrential rain um, instead of snow where it was up north and so um, it flooded this area and also left over water from the flood and the tectonic plates smashing together and so um these glacial lakes or um actually not so much glacial, glacial lakes just more just the flood trap left water. over yeah lakes um appeared here in and this is and then there was a breach of mm -hmm. a dam another breach of the dam which we've seen other places um in already we saw a ice dam breach mm -hmm. uh, lake missoula we saw lake bonville mm -hmm. breach a dam at red rock pass and both of those are it, practices that are accepted and understood by secular geologists now. You know, as we saw, there was some skepticism years ago, but now it's readily accepted. But this is a different situation. The Grand Canyon, they just do not want to accept that it was a breach dam that, that formed it. They still are holding to um, that it was the Colorado River mm -hmm. over millions of years. And so we see the 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 um, Colorado River or the the uh, I'm sorry the Grand Canyon forming carved and, and also this brown right down here this would be from the sediments from the lakes and so it's basically carried along the Colorado River and deposited right here and so this area is known for its fertile soil and also its plants that are grown and, here and sand lots and of sand. sand. Uh, sand dunes over by Yuma, if you've driven uh, through there, the Sonora Desert, uh, a lot of sand dunes. In fact, mm -hmm. um, they, they um, before this was deposited, um, even secular geologists say that the water actually extended quite further up, and this actually filled it in and, and filled in that water body uh, with those deposits. Is that the uh, Gulf of Mexico? Yes, it mm -hmm. is. Yes, it is, down below Arizona and California. And so, um, the Grand Canyon. And Abby's going to talk through our, our little field trip we had here. So let me click in there. 
So last summer we did a geology oh, field trip and it was about 11 days long and so will this work? Um, we went to Bryce first and then to the Grand Canyon and this is our first stop and um, Bryce is known, whoops, go back. And this is our, um, where we stayed, we had a pretty view and um, Bryce is known for its hoodoos and um, this was carved out by water after the flood. So basically, um, as the water was running off of the mountains, it carved these hoodoos and they're really pretty. Um, the different colors you see here are different um, kinds of sand and rock and dirt. And um, it's really, really pretty country. And what forms a hoodoo is that the upper part is less erosive than the bottom part. So it almost puts a protective cap on. And what's interesting, see this part right here is um, more prone to weather use than this part up here. And then down here, um, not so much as in the middle portion. It's really pretty. Yeah, and when we look at Bryce, um, we know from a creation point of view, this, this actually fits better in our time scale than, than in, in a millions of years time scale. The reason is that we see these formations are, are eroding in front of our eyes. They can measure it over the years and find erosion. Bryce will not be there, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years from now, at least not in the form it is today. It is eroding and they're, they're losing like natural bridges and mm -hmm. things are eroding in front of our eyes over decades and hundreds of years, you know, not, not maybe year to year or week to week. So if it has been millions of years, all that would be gone. So just that it exists is evidence of a young earth. And here's more hoodoos. This is a famous one called Thor's Hammer. And it's um, really pretty in different times of day because the colors change from morning to midday into um, evening. And sometimes it can even be seen as purple if the weather conditions are right. And um, some, we went on a Wall Street hike and these are massive, massive walls right here. And it's kind of creepy because if you see right here, you're kind of walking under this rock right here and it's a little creepy. So yeah, and then we're enjoying the rocks. <laughs> And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, most people would be going down the trail going, isn't it a gorgeous view? And Abby We're and I would have fossils. our noses in the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there always seemed to be a raven wherever we went. So, <laughs> whoops. Oh, what happened? Uh oh, what happened? Uh, by the way, were there any rattlesnakes? Oh, you hit the blackout button. Oh. No. No, we didn't see any. There are rattlesnakes mm -hmm, in that area, are. but we didn't see any. And so... Here's um, what they call, whoops, go back, natural bridges, which are these right here, and then these are windows, so carved out by water, and here's some more natural bridges over here. They're really pretty. And again, in that we see these falling apart over the decades, we know they didn't last millions of years. Does a wind have anything to do with the erosion? Wind is an erosional feature, yes, and so are freezes and thaws, which this is up at around 8,000, 8,500 feet. They get a lot of snow up here. So this is called the Grand Staircase, and you can see the different layers in the staircase. And as you look out, there's, um, what are the top layers even? Do you remember? Mm, we have a map out there. No, yeah. I don't remember the name of them. So there's a white layer back here. There's the red orange layer right here and as you go down farther there's a gray layer and so basically as the water eroded it just um, carved out these layers and it looks like a staircase from a large scale. So again think of it that accident happening you have your crumple zone and at the end of the flood you have land mass going up because of the crumple zone water is flowing off of it as water sheds off of it it's eroding but on a great scale and here you have basically it creating these giant stair steps going down. So they're all erosional features. Okay, and we went for a drive. There's more hoodoos, a very tall one. A lot of sandstone, yeah. it's all sedimentary rock. And different parts of the Grand Staircase. <laughs> and some pretty wildflowers, they're so pretty. 
and just more um, different layers in the grand staircase. Um, this was a tire change and uh, we finally made it to the um, Grand Canyon after our tire change and it was so pretty. Just looking at the layers and seeing it for the first time was amazing. It's so massive and um, more views that Go back. Go back. No. What we're looking at is the Grand Canyon. So we're looking out at um, the erosion of thousands, uh, about 5,000 feet of, of material that eroded out. And I, I believe it very quickly, just like Lake Missoula Flood, that's why we spent so much time on that, and also like what we've seen in Mount St. Helens, it eroded in a relatively a short period of time. When that dam broke, water came rushing out at huge volumes and carved this out. Now, when I stand at the, at the brink of the Grand Canyon and I see this, um, to me, what's almost more amazing than, the, than the, the erosion that you see, the faces and the layers, is when you stop and think about all of this material was laid down by something. It's all sedimentary materials laid down by water. And when you get an idea of the magnitude of the sediments that we're depositing out, that means that water that event was huge. It was absolutely huge. So to me, what's more impressive is what you don't see in those pictures. And that's the sediment that was basically blown out by the flood of the Grand Canyon. But all that dirt that was laid down. And we can only see it at the Grand Canyon because they had that breach dam, that accident that carved it out and exposed those layers. We're standing on layers like that. And much of the continent in North America has very much the same layers. Um, so it's enormous. And when you start thinking about the magnitude, you're like, okay, no, it wasn't millions of years. It had to be something very catastrophic. So while we were there, is this gonna work? My dad celebrated his birthday. <laughs> it was really fun. Best birthday gift ever, really. And um, so we went on a little drive and um, around the Grand Canyon. It was a really pretty day. Um, and the next day went for a hike down into the canyon, about 11,000 feet down and back no, up. 1,100, sorry, not thousands. That'd be a long time. Felt like 11,000. <laughs> it did feel like it. Um, it was really pretty. We got up super early in the morning, like 4.30 in the morning. And um, we got there to the canyon about five. And it was about three hour hike. Yeah, we wanted to see the sunrise. Yeah. And it was beautiful. We got to see the sunrise. And um, here's the trail. We climbed that right there. It was kind of scary at times. But it was really fun. Um, there's more pictures. Um, it was so pretty. How wide is that trail? Um, about uh, this wide. Yeah. But it could be this wide. <laughs> and it has really steep, um, like, crevices. And it's easy to fall in that trail. But it was really fun. And there's the... Um, you want to talk about the bending? Yeah. Go back. Oh, go back. Okay. You want to talk about it? Right there. Go ahead. So um, this is more from, yikes, I keep hitting the wrong button. Okay. Go back, go back. See so right here, this would be from the flood. And the reason why it bent is because it was wet. It had to be wet in order to bend like that. So you just see that these weren't laid down but when it was dry. It had to be wet. And yeah, maybe a partial uplift, yeah, you, but you'll see in places, this is a small one, but in places you'll see hundreds if not thousands of feet of bent material. In fact, a great place to see it is on the grapevine. Next time you drive to LA, look at some of the geology very closely. Um, it's amazing. The grapevine's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Carrie, Carrie doesn't want me to look too close, but it's, you see that, that material that must have been pliable to have bent almost in a U. Um, and you see hundreds, if not thousands of feet sometimes doing that. If it was laid down in millions of years, obviously it didn't all stay dry for millions of years. 
So it had to be all in the pretty much same condition to bend at the same time, evidence of a young earth. So more pictures, as you can see, the road is very rugged, but it was so pretty just coming out here. Um, here's our um, halfway down our hike. We stopped and rested before going back up. Um, it's just so pretty. Going back up was surprisingly easy. <laughs> the first 100 feet were killer, but after you got past that, it was a little easier. So um, we found fossils on our hike. These are marine fossils. They're actually not that big, only about that big. And the, it's about the size of a um, eraser head on a mm -hmm. pencil right there. Um, it's a crinoid. This one right here. And that's a brachiopod. All, they're all marine fossils. And so we basically found marine fossils in every hike we went. Mm -hmm. They don't want you collecting. No. <laughs> and we didn't collect either. We took pictures. And so this is, we did a little tour and um, some Indian ruins. This is where they would build their homes in the rocks and more homes right here. It was pretty fascinating in the Grand Canyon. And then this was actually built as a replica um, in the 1920s. And it's really pretty because you can look out of the canyon. The canyon would be this way, so you're looking out over the canyon. Um, and then um, sunset at the Grand Canyon, which is absolutely breathtaking. And you can see the stars come out, and the stars are so bright because there's no lights whatsoever. Um, and then more fossils. This is on another trail. Um, so this is a bracket. Crinoids. Crinoids. And there's two of them right here. And then, so what was amazing was the um, scripture on the different stores we would go to, which is pretty cool, coming from a secular park. And then we found more fossils. These were bigger than the ones we found before. And there are tons and tons of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all. Yep. All right. So, um, canyons are very much a testimony of, of a young earth, and we're going to watch a quick video here that talks about that. The earth's surface is scarred by deep canyons cut into solid rock. But how did they form? A little bit of water over a long time, or a little bit of time with a lot of water? Modern rivers don't generally cut downward into the solid rock, so today's river erosion seems incapable of explaining rock canyons. The great flood of the Bible, however, provides a possible explanation for such canyons. In soft mud or sand in your own backyard, you can see the power of heavy rains on a small scale. A rainstorm can create miniature canyons in only minutes. Though these canyons are very small, cut into mud, they share many of the same characteristics as the world's great canyons. On a larger scale, mud flows have also been observed to form these features quickly. At Mount St. Helens, a single mud flow off the mountain carved Engineer's Canyon out of soft sediment in a single day, 100 feet deep. And the same thing even happened in solid rock. A series of mud flows created Lewitt and Step Canyons on the front face of Mount St. Helens, cutting hundreds of feet into solid rock over just a few years. We observe canyons being cut into rock today, but only by catastrophic processes. Just imagine how easy it would be to cut massive canyons during and after Noah's flood. Torrential water and mud flows, followed by uplift and heavy rains, created the right conditions to produce the world's canyons. Furthermore, it may have been easier when flood sediments had not fully hardened. 
Grand Canyon is a good example where we find evidence of catastrophic forces at work. Upstream is evidence of huge lakes. These lakes would never have formed if the canyon were already open below them. However, if these lakes had formed from rains after Noah's flood, and if the pressure of these waters broke through and carved through the recently deposited sediments, then we would expect to find surge deposits downstream. Below Grand Canyon, this is precisely what we find. Evidence of a lot of water cutting over a little bit of time. So yeah, that's what we see, and we see all these different layers, and it was just fascinating looking at them. Uh, here you have a chart comparing it to the actual. In fact, uh, I made our family memorize the layers and be able to. <laughs> we have pop quizzes when we go to a place. Okay, what's that layer down there? Oh, that's the Supai Super Group. Um, the Kaibab limestone, and you know, I had them. Coconino sandstone. Yeah. So, yeah, if you go on field trips with me, that's what we do. Um, and uh, what was amazing was um, you can't help, I mean, when you, we started this class by talking about glasses. And when you put on a set of biblical glasses, in other words, you understand that there was a fl global flood of the proportions that we talked about last week. Then when you look at geology, when you look at the data, the evidence is in front of your eyes, you go, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, we were even in the visitor center. This map is a giant map in the visitor center. It's a relief map of the Grand Canyon. And I'm even looking at uh, the erosional features above the Grand Canyon. It's all speaking of water basically going from this direction over to here. Um, one of the reasons for our field trip was really to look at this area over here, uh, east of the Grand Canyon to see if we saw evidences of a, of a giant lake. And you can't help but see that. In fact, we saw even as we were driving along the highway, uh, evidences of, of um, large ancient rivers flowing into that lake. Um, in fact, I was, kept telling the family, look at that, look at that erosional feature. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the, um, one of the things about the Grand Canyon is, if you know it, uh, this is the high point right here. And if you ever see it with snow on it, this, the, you get snow right across here. And so this was the dam right here, basically, that blew out right here. Uh, this is around 8,000, 8,500 feet. This is around 7,500 feet right here. And so this is lower here. This is lower here. So this was the dam right here holding it in place. Um, but uh, the water actually was much higher than that, too. And so here's a diagram showing how it probably worked. You had the Kenyan Lands Lake here, Hopi Lake here. And much like the others, it built up pressure. Water was grow, uh, come, going up and up and up, most likely from the, those Ice Age rain events for hundreds of years. And once it hit a certain level, there was a weak spot, and it let go. And so... Uh, there's two places, the Little Colorado River and the Upper Colorado River, where it gouged out the, the two entry canyons into that and basically blew it out. And the other thing we see in large um, flood events that we know about, like Mount St. Helens, like Lake Missoula, we see side canyons form. Because that has been a mystery for secular scientists is how do you get all these side canyons when there's no evidence of a creek ever existing there? Well, in these large erosional events or even the smaller erosional events, when we look at like I, I, I do erosion at construction sites, that's my job as an environmental consultant. When we look at smaller gullies like forming on a, you know, out of control erosion on a job site or a farm, you see these side fingers start forming and it's just a natural feature of erosion. Somebody had their hand up. Me. Yeah. Uh, you know, when the lake blows out, I look at the serpentine look of these canyons or rivers. Why doesn't it just go straight? Well, it's taken the path of least resistance. So perhaps the sediments were weaker there uh, or, or um, 
it maybe was following a natural pattern, uh, somewhat a natural topographic pattern, and then just gouging it out there. But yeah, that's a good question. But it, the water takes the path of least resistance, and we see that today as well. Does somebody else have their hand up? All right. Well, I, I yeah. On the, uh, on the, at the beginning of the, of the flow, were the slopes much flatter there than they are in the canyon itself? At the very, at the, at the lake portion? Where, where was, was the slopes flatter? The slopes uh, at the beginning of the canyon, were they flatter than they were uh, after the dam? Uh, I'm not quite understanding you your question. Yeah. There. You say that the dam was at the high point. Yeah, so water was all over here was and pressure slopes, was being placed was here. Slopes on that side of the, of the dam? Flat on this side over here? Yeah. Um, I think if you look um, outside of the canyon, that is basically the elevation right here and over here is what it was. So that's the non-eroded part. In fact, I think I have a picture coming up of that. Yes, this one. Mm -hmm. I was so pleased to see this in the Is Genesis History movie because this is a picture I took. Uh, they didn't use my picture, they <laughs> took their own. Uh, I just wanted to make that clear. But I took this for a reason because this might not be exciting to you, but it's hugely exciting to me. And I think this is pointing to your, your, your question, Steve. Um, this right here is an erosional feature. This is above the Grand Canyon which means is that there was water at one time eroding above the Grand Canyon as well. And back here, the other reason I took the picture is this is the lake back here. This is where the water was at. So Steve, you can almost see what you're asking. In fact, see right here, right here behind that uh, butte, and then right here is one of the canyons. So you can see the, the topography of what most likely existed before the dam blew out. Uh, now, it's also possible that the dam, the dam might have blown out with the water also going over the Grand Canyon too. Um, people like Stephen Austin, who was in the movie, uh, they, they've been doing decades of work on this. In fact, there's some very, very good books out on the counter there that talk in detail about what happened with the, with the Grand Canyon. What's amazing to me is I would have talks with rangers when we were there. And they just hold to the line, no, it was the Colorado River, no, it was millions of years. But even when I read secular sources, they're moving away from that because it just, excuse the pun, doesn't hold water. Um, it really doesn't work, at, pencil out. And so they're moving away from that, even secular scientists. They're coming up with other theories uh, that are not biblically based, but they're, they're realizing that no, this is not a good theory. But yet, when you go to the Grand Canyon, that's, the, that's what they'll teach. That's, and, and I would even have conversation, not, not, I would try not to get antagonistic at all, but um, I just really would uh, throw out things onto the table and say, okay, well, what about this? And they had a hard time answering it. So here's just quickly some of the fossils. We already showed some of these. So. What's their explanation for finding marine fossils? Um, ancient seas, that mm -hmm. it was covered by um, several ancient seas oh. over millions of years. This is a sponge, by the way, oh. right here. Mm -hmm. This is a sponge. It's about, it's about that big. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really, really pretty. Very iridescent. <laughs> And this is a crinoid. Um, basically, this is it's laying down. So this would be like, uh, like if a palm tree was laying down. This would be the trunk, and then up here are very uh, soft tentacles, almost like a sea anemone. It would be. Um, in some of my pictures, you can see faint patterns of, of tentacles. I didn't get enough time to really g find great specimens. Sometimes there's some fabulous specimens showing all the, all the detail. Um, someday I want to go back and spend a couple days just looking at fossils, but we'll see. All right, so that's Southwest. Now let's bring it to California. That's what it all boils down to, right? California has some of the most fascinating geology in the United States. Uh, it is very diverse and it's very complicated uh, 
that's what we found out right away. In fact, California was the last place we looked at, and by far, it was the most complicated geology. Um, what makes it complicated is what, Abby? Let's talk about some of this. Um, the San Andreas Fault, which is right here. And then the Pacific plate rotation. So this plate down here is basically going all the way up here and twisting and going down in here. So that's going under the, um, the North American plate. And talk about the transverse mountains. So the transverse mountains, are we going to show the video? Yeah, we're going to show the okay. video, but talk about so those. So the transverse mountains are right here, and that's in LA, LA right there, area. Too. And right here, also right here. So both right here and here. And um, that's basically when this plate got rotated, it twisted this area, and so it's going east um, east to west instead of north to south. So if you know, if you traveled up and down California, one of the things you'll notice is in the LA area, all the way out to Palm Desert where you're at, so you were looking at San Jacinto <coughs> and San Gregor Greg Gregorio, uh, those mountain ranges, San Gabriel's, San Bernardino Mountains, they all go east-west. Everything else in the state in fact, the west coast goes north-south, right? But here they're going east-west. So what happened? Well, here's a um, basically a, a animation that was put together by um, secular geologists. And so you see the plates crashing in into the North American plate. Here's an, a close look. So the Fairlawn plate is subducting, but it all becomes completely subducted under California. Then notice what's happening down to the south. You get a ripping away of land because the Pacific plate is moving up. Here it goes again. Pacific plate's moving up. Notice right here this piece of land twisting. Um, and what else happens is the Gulf of California forms. And you get the, uh, the Baja California right here. All of that is the ripping away. In fact, we got another video right here that shows a little better. SB stands for Santa Barbara. SD stands for San Diego. And LA will still soon appear right here, LA. So we'll show this again. So this is after the Farallon plate has completely subducted. We no longer have subduction happening, meaning one plate going under another. Now we have what they call slip strike, uh, two faults moving alongside each other. The main fault line, you, these red lines you see are the faults, but this dark one is the um, San Andreas fault. Okay. Uh, what happens then with property lines? Uh, it's so slow, I know, but uh, say you have 120 <laughs> acres down there, uh, and your grandfather set it out. Now, now where are the stakes? Well, they, they do move, um, but fortunately we're more in a case like this where we're approaching equilibrium and what this, when, when property lines were moving dramatically here, I believe this was all underwater. I believe this was still, floodwaters were still covering the earth or it was starting to dewater. Uh, meaning that the plates were now crashing, you were getting uplift, and water was shedding off the continents. Uh, so, uh, in this type of movement, this would not be ha habitable. Everything would be wiped out. This is way beyond the worst case scenario you could imagine, or earthquake scenario you could imagine right now. Uh, this, you know, this is a continent being ripped apart. Um, Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. This is a secular animation, and behind Abby, I don't know if some of you can see this, they're actually showing millions of years. For, for I, I believe, a biblical perspective, it was a year. Mm -hmm. Sometime during the year. Maybe even much shorter than that, but I believe the plates were set into motion when the fountains of the deep were broken up. It may have taken a year to get those plates moving. They may have take, been less time. I don't know when it happened in the flood, but I'm pretty sure that um, when things started to dewater, that's the uplift, that's when the impact had happened and, and now water starting to shed off. Very interesting graphic. Uh, this was prepared by secular geologists. The only thing I disagree with is the little time scale down here. I, I think this is exactly how it happened. 
and it's hard to refute. Um, they'll even look at uh, uh, rock with magnetic uh, orientation, and in that transverse range, it's facing the wrong way, meaning that when it's solidified at one time, everything was facing magnetic north, but be, after it solidified and then did this rotation thing, it was facing uh, roughly 90 degrees off. And so, um, yeah, a lot of evidence is for, to me, it speaks of young Earth. Here's another animation here showing subduction. So when the Farallon plate was moving in, uh, what was happening is when you have subduction, you have volcanic activity. Now, this also is fascinating. Oops, I didn't, well, it'll come back. I think it's just uh, cycling through. Um, granite, which we have a lot of in the Sierras, is very unique. Granite is an igneous rock, meaning it's formed by volcanoes. And, uh, but granite is a crystal, basically. And it cannot be exposed to air. It will only form granite when it's not exposed to air. So when granite formed, it was most likely underground, maybe in saturated soils from floodwaters. And how did it cool so quickly? And that's the other thing it needs is it needs to cool quickly. Well, you have a lot of water. You got a mechanism to cool it quickly. So you have saturated soils. You have this right here where you see volcanic activity moving up and deposited in the granite. Then at, when, the, when the plates collided, you had the uplift, it raised that granite up higher in the mountains, and then you have erosion happening. First the shedding of the water with eroding off the topsoil off that granite, but then you have the ice age happening, which when we go uh, to Yosemite, that's what we're gonna be looking at. In Yosemite, we have tons of exposed granite called monoliths, um, and it was exposed by erosion uh, during the flood or post-flood and then the ice age that followed. Um, so fascinating situation. We already looked at this, so some of these are just repetitive things showing what we explained. Anything we're missing? Um, here's another cross-section of uh, two parts of the valley. Notice San Joaquin Valley right here. Mount Dana, Mount Whitney, further to the south, you can see the crumpled zone. In fact, the faulting even shows it has been impacted. You get the stress lines, and then on the other side, you have the, the Mono Basin and the Owens Valley. Um, very fascinating geology. And then uh, again, we see that trapped water like we saw in Nevada, only this time uh, the um, um, Death Valley. Death Valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Mojave Desert. And these lakes are also salty from the floodwaters. Yes, and, and because they don't have um, any sources, any, any real sources, you know, Death Valley doesn't get a lot of rain. So how did it have these huge lakes? Where did they come from? Well, uh, from biblical point of view, we have an explanation. Mm -hmm. All right, Abby, you want to explain this? So this right here is the San Francisco Bay. And um, this is right here, San Francisco. And as the um, ice age was melting, it basically flooded this whole area. And so that's how we get some of our water in the valley, the Central Valley. And so these are the islands, the Fairline, Fairline Islands out here. And then um, this dam right here breached. See, uh, Which is the Cartina Strait. And it breached once again, and so all this water. Cartina Strait came was back also out. a breached dam. And so the valley at one time was full of water. Where did it get its water? From the flood. Well, and, same places, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and torrential, From the flood and the torrential rains during the Ice Age. It basically pooled in the valley. And then the ice age melt mm -hmm. because we know like Yosemite had thousands of feet of ice. One of the things I want to point out is, let's back this one up and start it again and I'll stall it. Uh, right there, whoops. Oops. Anyways, yeah, right there. Notice um, right here, this is the Golden Gate Bridge right here. And at the peak of the Ice Age, 
the sea levels were a lot lower. What is the main concern today? You know? Oceans are rising. Oceans are rising. Why? Because, because of ice is melting. Because the, uh, the Arctic caps are melting. Again, going into equilibrium. They're melting, so the oceans are going up. But at the peak of the Ice Age, there was so much water entrained as ice on the surface of the, of the Earth. Uh, you know, you heard the figures at Glacier Lake and the, how deep the ice was in, in uh, Lake Missoula. In Yellowstone, they estimate that it was under 3,500 feet of ice was being held there. Uh, Minnesota had ice on it. All of Canada had ice on it. You know, we're talking thousands, thousands of feet of ice. And so you had all this ice, water entrained as ice. What that effectively did was this. It lowered the oceans. Now, we're only looking at San Francisco Bay. But basically, you could walk out. How far is the Farallone Islands off, off the coast? Anybody know? It's roughly, I think, 20 miles, maybe further, at least 20 miles. You, there was a river, an ancient river. They, they know that. They can see the remains of it that went out the Golden Gate Bridge and went out here. But here's the islands. You could walk out to those islands. That's how they got animals on them. In fact, that's how it, a lot of people go, well, how did animals get on Australia? If you think it was a flood and, and Noah was deposited in Turkey, how did the animals get to Australia? Well, there was land bridges, so sea water was much lower. They came through Indonesia. That whole chain of islands was a land bridge, basically from Asia to get the animals to, to Australia. And then the, across the um, Bering Russia. Strait from Russia to the North America, huge land bridges to get both people and animals during that ice age. So you can almost see God's plan. Isn't that how God would do something? Go, well, I got to get the earth repopulated, I've moved these continents around, I got to get man and animals to these different places. And so he allowed the Ice Age, which was just a natural reaction to the flood, to occur. And that allowed things to populate. And so again, running this, oops, I want to run that animation again. Maybe we do. There we go. So you can see as the ice melts, it fills up. The other thing is the valley's filling up from runoff and rains and, and the valley fills up. And that's why we have so much sediment in the valley. It's a giant ancient lake bed. But as the water pressure builds up on Cortina's Strait, it blows out and, and uh, creates what we know as our delta. Yes? I thought something was very interesting because just driving from Tracy across uh, the freeway there to Pleasanton or Livermore, uh, you can see where they had a lake level there. Mm -hmm. I always thought, well, the cows have always walked along here. Yeah, but no, when you can they see them. Describe that. It was like, well, that's what I was thinking the cows made. Yeah. But instead, it was waves from a, a giant lake yeah. that was up against those hills. Kelly, Abby's got a, uh, a demonstration. We're going to go see Shell Ridge, and we're going to see piles and piles of shells. Mm -hmm. How did they get there? Well, um, so, we actually saw a secular geologist mm -hmm. explain this, and we think he's right. So this is an average Oreo, and you break it apart, and this becomes the Juan de Fuca plate right here without any frosting or hardly any. And this little piece of frosting right here is what we would call the North American plate. And so you, basically the Juan de Fuca plate came up and scraped off all the mountains onto the plate. And so you see this right all here. All the frosting. All the frosting. And um, this would be the mountains. And so basically that's your little Oreo demonstration. So, so <laughs> it's a simple way to explain a lot of California geology. It was really a, uh, that Fairlawn plate subduction scraping up the sediments and piling them mm -hmm. up. And that's why we see piles of shells, of, of basically stuff that was on the bottom of the sea. It's just mm -hmm. piled up. And so you're going to see stuff like this. Now, <laughs> I took this picture in the um, Monterey Bay um, Aquarium. 
It caught my eye for two reasons. One, that number shows up again. Why 4,000 years? So it says, and showing, it, this, this aren't real shells, it's a replica, but it's showing stuff you're going to see out at Walnut Creek, uh, out there. It's these piles of shells in the rocks. And, and it says, these shells are the remains of long ago meals. Buried piles of shells show that 4,000 years ago, people ate oysters and clams just as we do today. <laughs> Just saying, people must have really liked oysters and clams. <laughs> yeah, especially when you start seeing how many shells are out there. They must have really liked oysters and clams. 4,000 years ago, hmm. Who's, whose worldview is this data fitting? It, I mean, does this even seem reasonable that they got through this oyster craze? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. No. <laughs> so that's our presentation, geology from a biblical perspective. Just remember, we're going to, you know, with these last few words, we're going to wrap up our faith and science series. But I hope I have challenged you and Abby's challenged you, and you've challenged yourself by reading some of the materials that you picked up, that we need to put on biblical worldview glasses. In other words, when we read the Bible, we decide whether we're going to believe it or not. And does it mean what it says? And, and that's the faith part, because that goes beyond science. At some point, we have to believe something. And if we're going to believe God's Word is true, then let's believe it's true. And then let's take that belief and let's look at the things around us and see how does that fit our, our worldview. Does it match up? And I, 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 hopefully, I've challenged you to say yes. It matches up beautifully, beautifully. Remember, we're all looking at the same data. The evolutionist, the uniformitarian, the Hindu, the Buddhist. Everyone's looking at the same data. But how we interpret it is based on what we believe. All right. Well, so that's, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Abby. All right, so these are all recorded. They're on YouTube. They're on the church's website. I hope that you can take this stuff and use it to share with your friends the gospel because the gospel is seen here. And remember, we have a hope. And so God bless you, and we'll be talking. Hopefully you can join our field trips. And if you can't join these, don't worry. We'll have more in the future, and we'll consider you alumni, and you'll get invited. All right. <laughs>